members of the public, um, either take a seat in the back or go out in the hallway to finish your conversations, please. And would ask that anybody with a cell phone to put it on vibrate or turn it off, please. My name is Tom O'Connell, and welcome you to the uh, Stripe Bass Management Board meeting. Um, all of you have an should have an agenda before you, and the first order of business is to approve the agenda. Are there any uh, suggested changes to the agenda? All right, seeing none, we got one, Fish and Wildlife. Mr. Chairman, if time allows, we'd like to give a quick update on the 14 uh, cooperative tagging crews, where we are with that. Sure, we'll put that on, under other business if time allows. Thank you. Seeing no other comment, the, the, the agenda will stand approved. I um, want to mention this is our first meeting since the uh, 2012 annual meeting in October. Um, we do not have the proceedings from that meeting. If you recall, Joe's uh, wife had an illness at that time, and we, there were some issues with uh, 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 some of the proceedings were lost. Staff have prepared a meeting summary, and if you need to reference those in the future, you know, contact myself or Mike. Um, we do have a public comment period. Um, this is an opportunity for members of the public to uh, provide the board comment on items that are not on the agenda. Uh, we have one person that has signed up to speak at this time, uh, Jim Price. Uh, Jim, if you would like to come up to the microphone. Um, we do have a, um, while Jim is coming up to the microphone, we do have a, you know, we have a one-hour meeting time today, so I'm going to try to keep us moving along. Um, Jim, your hand, your um, right, your write-up was included in the board's packet of material, so if you could keep your comments to a couple minutes to highlight that, I'd appreciate it. Thanks. All right, thank you. Uh, my name is uh, Jim Price. I'm president of the Chesapeake Bay Ecological Foundation. And I would like to inform the board that the public was advised at a recent meeting of the Chesapeake Bay Program Sustainable Fisheries Goal Implementation Team that the team believes the ASMFC should be responsible for addressing the collapse of the uh, Chesapeake Bay and Mid-Atlantic Coast Striped Bass Forage Base, since ASMFC is responsible for managing striped bass in Menhaden. However, according to the ASMFC, the overfish status of Menhaden is unknown, and but overfishing is occurring. Although the ASMFC places a high priority on continuing work on developing ecosystem reference points which would explicitly address the forage needs of Menhaden predators such as striped bass, this work is anticipated to take some time because of its complexity. It would be uh, an understatement to say the board has been struggling with this issue for years. Uh, CBEF um, has provided the ASMFC with a copy of our research summary and chart we recommend that the ASMFC consider using biological reference points for the nutritional status of Chesapeake Bay striped bass as recommended by a recent published paper in the North American Journal of Fisheries Management. And that's a, uh, a new piece of equipment, by the way, that's, that's been developed. It's called a bioimpedance analysis meter. And we can actually go out and check the health or the nutritional state of a fish without killing the fish or cutting it open. So there's been a sort of a breakthrough in the ability to do ecosystem management using this as one of the tools that would be able to determine whether there's enough forage for striped bass or not. So I think it's a very important uh, issue for the board to consider both Manhattan and Striped Bass Board. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Were there any other members from the public that wanted to provide input to the board on items not on the agenda? All right, thanks. So um, the next item on the agenda is a review of some of the fisheries landings data. As you may recall, we're um, in the process of uh, peer review in the stock assessment that was completed this summer. And while that stock assessment and peer review is not available yet, um, some of the fisheries performance data is. Um, Katie Drew is going to provide an overview of that. And then we're going to be talking, just having a discussion in regards to 
uh, preparing for the results of the stock assessment that will be available later this fall. Uh, we had a motion postponed back in November 2011 to take some action or consider some action um, following the stock assessment completion. So we'll be having a conversation today um, to manage the expectation as to um, what the timeline, what the pathway will be if the stock assessment suggests some management action should be taken. So to, to begin that conversation, Katie is going to review some of the fisheries landings data, and then Mike's going to go over, um, kind of bring us up to speed on the stock assessment and different pathways that we can take a look at if action is warranted this fall. Thanks, Katie. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so as we just covered, I'm going to go over um, commercial landings, recreational landings, uh, some of the adult indices, as well as the juvenile indices, which have all been updated through 2012. And this information was all included in the stock assessment. And then I'm just going to touch briefly on where we are with the assessment and kind of what the ne next steps are in making sure it's available for management use. So commercial landings was about 6.4 million pounds in 2012. This translates to about 839,000 fish, and it's 2% less than 2011. You can see in the graph the effects of having a quota management system, a quota system in place for striped bass in that landings have been fairly constant since the late 1990s. Recreational landings uh, were about 1.49 million fish harvested in 2012 and about 5.37 million fish released alive. Um, if you assume a 9% mortality rate due to catch and release, that translates to about 483,000 fish that were killed by catch and release mortality. Um, so the total removals were slightly less than 2 million fish attributed to the recreational fishery. Um, these total removals are 30% less than 2011, so it continues kind of the downward trend that we've seen um, in the recreational landings. You can compare this to the about 839,000 fish caught by the commercial landings, and you can see that um, the fishery is still dominated, as usual, by recreational landings. So it's about two-thirds recreational and about one-third commercial, even with the decline, recent decline in recreational landings. These are the adult indices, fishery independent indices that are used in the assessment. We also have two that I'm not showing on this graph, the New York Ocean Hall Seine Survey and the Northeast Fishery Science Center Bottom Trawl Survey. They end before, um, the last couple of years of those are not directly comparable to the complete time series because of gear changes. And so we end those time series in about 2008. Um, so I'm only showing indices that have data through 2012. Um, and you can see for most of them, there's been a decline in at least a recent couple of years. Uh, New Jersey is the only one who's uh, shown a little bit of an uptick in 2012. These are the fishery dependent indices that we use in the assessment. This is the MRF CPUE on the left, um, <clears throat> which has continued to decline, and uh, the Virginia Pound Net Index, which shows a small uptick from a low value in 2011. Uh, I'm also going to go over the juvenile abundance indices that we review every year for signs of recruitment failure. Just as a reminder, recruitment failure is considered to have occurred when the index falls below the trigger value for three consecutive years. The trigger value is defined as the 25th percentile of each index over a set period of time, and that set period of time is different between the different indices. Recruitment failure was not triggered for any of the indices that we reviewed this year. This is the main index. Uh, it's not included in the assessment, but is considered as part of the trigger review. It was slightly above average in 2012. It was below Q1, the Q1 trigger point in 2010, but above it in 2011 and 2012, and so was not triggered. This is New York and New Jersey. Um, the 2012 value was below the trigger for both states, and for New York, it was also below it in 2011, although that may show the effects of uh, Tropical Storm Irene moving through, which happened during the sampling period. Um, however, um, 2010 was above the value for both states, so neither of them were triggered this year. This is Maryland and Virginia. 2012 was again below the Q1 reference point for both states, but 2011 and 2010 were above Q1 for both, so it was not triggered. In fact, uh, 2011 was fairly strong for both indices. This is North Carolina. Again, North Carolina is not considered in the, is not used in the assessment, but is considered as part of the trigger exercises, and it's been above its Q1 uh, reference point for all three years. So I'm going to switch gear a little and talk about next steps for the assessment. As our chair mentioned, we are somewhat in limbo at the moment with this assessment. 
the review the review was completed or there was the the review workshop was completed in july however the final report is not available right now it's expected to be available um, sometime in mid-september um, and the biggest change is really um, the new F reference points that were proposed in the assessment to be consistent with the current SSB reference points. So that's probably the most, the biggest change um, for a management um, consideration. Overall, the peer review seemed to find it acceptable for management use. However, until we get the final written report, report, we won't know all the details about what they considered acceptable, what they considered dubious or unacceptable, or what they had issues with that the board might want to consider going forward. In addition, um, the model was run with preliminary 2012 data. So we wanted to have something in place for 2012, but when we were completing the assessment, we did not have time to wait for the final data. Um, so the 2012 values of F and SSB that are coming out of the model right now are, are based on preliminary data. The finalized data are available now at the moment, and the model, we plan to update the model with those data prior to the October board meeting. So when the October meeting comes around, we will have the complete stock assessment report, the complete peer review report, and an update with finalized 2012 data. But until then, it's not really ready for management use or management consideration. So that's all I have, and I'll take questions. Great job, Katie. Any uh, questions or comments for Katie? Yes. Go ahead, Lauren. Yes, thank you for that uh, excellent report. Uh, you mentioned, I believe, uh, in your second or third slide that there uh, was a 30% reduction in recreational landings. Uh, I believe the years being compared were 2011 and 2012. Uh, could you give us some broad strokes of uh, uh, reasons why we would expect or why we had seen such a, a, a significant uh, change? Thank you. I think probably the biggest effect, and you can, if you look at the graph, what you can see is that the blue bars um, represent the harvest. So that's what people actually land. And the red bars are what are, is on top of that that we assume die due to being kept, released. And it's really the releases that have dropped off. And in fact, it's even bigger when you actually look at the total number of releases, not just the, the percentage that we assume die. So probably this is an effect of the weak recruitment coming through, that those ones that are released are usually undersized, smaller fish. So with the weaker recruitment that has been coming through the population, you've got um, less fish that are available to be caught that are undersized. So people are still catching the, the retainable ones, and those landings have not dropped off nearly as much. It's the smaller ones that um, people are releasing that just are not recruiting into the fishery as well. So I think that's probably the big driver in terms of, of why these landings have dropped off. Got Pat. Yeah, uh, thanks for the report, Dr. Katie. Uh, have we used 9% as the assumed mortality rate for the last three or four years, or has that been constant for a longer period of time? We updated it for this assessment. The last time we were using 8%, which was, it's based on um, the paper by Diodati and Richards, and the, the value of 8% is not what's actually in the paper. The final paper value was 9%, which is why we changed it this year. I think we were working off of some preliminary data for earlier years, which is why we used the 8%. But we did do a pretty thorough literature review on um, release rates, um, and it was consistent with a 9% mortality rate. Okay, and to follow on, Mr. Chairman, uh, following up on Lauren's comment about the recreational uh, reduction, uh, do you think or do we have any way of knowing whether or not the change to circle hooks has had any negative or positive impact, or is it too early to tell uh, what that switchover is all, where we've gone from J-hooks primarily to circle hooks? There's, I think there's not really a way to tell because the problem is there's so many confounding factors in terms of releases, in terms of what causes release mortality, and the fact is we have not really been able to track what proportion of the population is actually using circle hooks. I think we know there has been a general shift, but in terms of overall numbers of what's being released, that's not something we track or have an idea of. And the final technical one would be, uh, this is based, would be based more on an ongoing study. Have we looked at the possible change in temperature in those areas where, for instance, north to south, where we've had a heat wave in New York uh, for a period of time, and I think most of them down the coast, whether we'll see a related increase in mortality, uh, release mortality. I know that once the temperature is over 68 or 70 degrees, 
boy, it's, it's sure hell to keep these fish alive if you've had them on a line for a while. And I'm wondering if that might be a study that someone might want to look at in the future. I think it'd be a value. I mean, and that was certainly one of the things we tried to look at with the re release mortality this year, but the data just were not, of, uh, most of the studies have focused on other factors, and so temperature was really hard to, to tease out from that, especially in salt water. And also getting the, considering that the releases occur on a wave basis, um, which is basically a two-month time period, you'd have to pick a temperature for that two-month time period. Um, so we had a hard time settling that, but it's something that the TC would like to see addressed further. All right, Bill. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Could you go back to the slide on the commercial catches? So, so what what you're saying here is there's 839 fish landed, uh, 6.4 million pounds. Is that that was it? Okay. All right. Thank you. Got okay, Rob. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I just wanted to ask on that last slide. <clears throat> with the, uh, the red bars, there we go. Before they're completely red bars, they are uh, just released to live fish. And one of the great concerns in 2011 was the large drop in the B2s, or the fish that were released alive. That was talked about quite a bit heading into that meeting in Boston. It appears that maybe that has continued that the number of fish released alive is still down overall, except for perhaps 2011, that looks like. I can't read the, the axis from here, but uh, since that was such a huge um, point that was made several times, is that trend continuing that the B2s are um, just a smaller component than they were previously? And a little follow-up there is what do the proportionate age, what does that show in terms of abundance uh, for, say, the four to eight-year-old and also separately the eight-plus because the eight-plus has been used as sort of a, a diagnostic for the health of the stock as well? Yes, the, the B2s have continued to decline, and that's where the majority of that big 30% um, removals is uh, the drop is coming from. Um, I'm afraid I don't have the the catch at age data right now available to to answer the question in terms of how that has changed over time. But I think it's it's consistent with um, what we're seeing here, which is fewer proportionally fewer smaller younger fish in um, in the catch. Okay, I got Michelle and then Tom Forty. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So just one point of information for the board. Um, the North Carolina is required to update our assessment of the Albemarle Roanoke stock as well, and that's in a very similar time frame as the coastwide assessment. So I expect that at the annual meeting, I'll be able to give you a little bit more information on that. It's currently being reviewed. And then, Katie, I was wondering, and this is an, this is a, an ignorant non-modeler question that I have for you, but... Um, just in terms of shifts in distribution, I mean, this is kind of a larger scale question that is touching, you know, many other species besides striped bass. And I'm assuming that this model cannot really, it doesn't have a spatial component to account for something like that. Are there models out there or have you all discussed, um, you know, trying to take into account shifts in, in distribution? I mean, I'll just say for North Carolina, we had zero fish landed commercially or recreationally this year zero. So just wondering if you have any insight on that. Thanks. I mean, certainly, as you as you said, you are correct. This model does not have a spatial component. And it's something we try to look into. It's something we're definitely interested in with striped bass, not only because of, of possible temperature or whatever induced shifts, but also because this is it's a three, almost a three-stock complex, really, that we're managing as a single spatial stock. Um, right now, the data that we have, even with our extensive tagging data, are not quite um, good enough to help us set up um, a, a model with migration and immigration components. So um, I think it is something that we want to consider going further with in the future, but right now we can't handle that, those, kinds of, those kinds of shifts. All right, Tom Foti. We, we make a lot of assumptions, and you make assumptions based on the fishery being consistent for the last 20 years. This fishery has completely changed in the last 20 years. 
if you look at New Jersey 20 years ago, most of the striped bass fishermen were catch and release fishermen. They really were not keeping. They take one home a week, maybe a, f a few like that, but they were mostly doing catch and release. That's when our numbers were really high. When you started cutting down on summer flounder and a few other species where these people could go targeting in May and June and everything like that, they all of a sudden switched to be striped bass fishermen, but they were meat fishermen. They also, the gas prices went up. So a guy, when he gets his, or a girl, when they get their fish that they're going to take home to go in, they go in. They don't sit there. Matter of fact, a lot of the charter boat ca captain says, as soon as you put your two fish limit in New Jersey, we're heading to the dock. I mean, and that's really what happens here. So that's changed the whole philosophy of catch and release that was bringing those big numbers that we had in the 90s and even in the early 2000s. The other problem is we've, we've switched this fishery to a different fishery. I mean, back then we were using poppers, little bucktails, and basically targeting small fish. When you're using three-pound, four-pound bunker, as big as you can get, you're looking for big fish, and that's what people are fishing for. So they're targeting the big fish. They're not looking for the small fish. So that's going to cloud your figures. So trying to compare what was going on 20 years ago and what's going on now is a whole different fishery. And we need to basically put that into the mix. I'm not saying it's totally wrong, but there's a lot of changes of what the recreational sector has done. Gas prices, the, the, the way that people fish, and who is fishing. Those are the big three. I mean, and I see that in Jersey. I mean, you know, when I used to go out in 2002, maybe one guy on the boat would keep one fish. Now you go out, they keep eight fish, but they go back to the dock. And that's what they're doing. And so there's not this continuously catch and release there was a long time ago. And also gas prices. Gas prices. People are not spending a lot of money to go out and fish if they can't take something home to eat a lot nowadays. It's a different type of fishery. So we need to take that into consideration. Now, I, I don't know if, uh, if anybody's doing any surveys on that. I would basically look at Southwicks and see if they put any in information together like that, Look, because they do a lot of st studies on recreational fishing and their trends. But we really need to look at the trends. And we, we make assumptions. And we make assumptions when we look at models. And I know that always gets us in trouble. If we're looking at what things and things have changed in those models or the way the data is going to the models because what people are doing, then we have to take that into consideration and, you know, and pay attention to it. Thanks, Tom. I got Paul. Uh, I guess it, it wasn't clear to me, is this all we're going to hear today uh, relative to the updated stock assessment? Okay, so we're going to wait for the uh, peer review results. But what you did present, um, well, you talked a little bit about um, the new reference points relative to uh, fishing mortality. And uh, I guess you're waiting to hear about that. But can you talk about what direction it might go? Um, where would that benchmark go? Not what the value is, but directionally, what are you thinking? So the big change that we made is, um, well, as you know, the current SSB reference point is, a, is sort of a historical or empirical-based reference point where we use the estimate of the 1995 SSB as our threshold. So for a number of reasons, we decided that that was um, – we were satisfied with the stock in that condition. So the 1995 SSB is our um, biomass threshold. Previously in management, the F reference point that we chose to complement that was a model-based MSY reference point. So we used um, a standard MSY ap modeling approach to come up with an F value um, of about 0.3 that um, was supposed to match up with the, SS the historical SSB um, estimate that we use for our SSB threshold. And the the problem we were finding as we is that the two of them didn't really have a sort of a theoretical background to link them. So what we've done for this model for this assessment is we've kept the SSB um, threshold the same, and instead we've done projections using empirical recruitment and and sort of what we know about the biology of the stock to project the stock forward and figure out what F value gives you that SSB value that we want, and that is our new SSB. Um, so that is our new F threshold. And then we have a similar approach for the, the target, which the target is 125% of the 1995 SSB. And we chose an F value in the same way that if you project the stock forward with our, with our empirical estimates of recruitment, the F that gives you that SSB target is our F target. What this does is it results in a lower F value than the current value we have um, on the record as our management 
threshold and target. Thanks, Katie. Okay. I, I have a few more follow-ups. Go ahead, Paul. Um, that sounds very logical to have gone that, that approach to follow that. Um, so it seems that, uh, assuming that the peer review agrees with this approach, that the new uh, F target and threshold is going to be lower than what we've been working with. Um, and I, from what I saw, what you already presented for um, a number, if not actually a majority of the adult indices that you demonstrated are in decline. And you also um, characterize uh, what the group believes is recruitment failure um, seems to be also going on in this uh, fishery. I thought that's what I heard. I thought you heard, I heard you say recruitment failure. I wouldn't say failure. I would say I think we're the recruitment value that recruitment that we've seen in recent years, not counting 2011. 2011 appears to have been a very strong year, but in recent in the recent recent couple of years, it's been lower than the very strong recruitment that we saw that really helped the stock recover through the late 90s and early 2000s. That was very strong recruitment. What we're seeing now is lower values of recruitment. I wouldn't say it's failure. It's definitely not near the values that we saw in the 80s when the stock was collapsed and 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 crushed. But it's definitely it's lower than some than the peak recruitment that we saw that really helped the stock build up. Mm -hmm. But substantially lower for the past eight out of the nine years. Lower, yeah. I, I, couldn't, I couldn't tell you the exact mm -hmm. percentage, so I don't want to, you know, oversell the situation, but okay. definitely lower, noticeably lower than the, the strongest year classes we've seen. Good, thanks. I got Roy. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just wanted to make sure that I heard Dr. Duvall correctly when she was characterizing her f recent fishery. May I follow up with her with a question? Um, Michelle, you said that uh, there were no commercial or recreational landings thus far this year. Did I hear you right? That's correct, Roy. So our, um, our commercial season starts December 1 of every year. We're not on a calendar year. So our 2012, our 2013 fishing year actually starts December 1, 2012, and then runs through the spring. So we had zero commercial landings, and we've had for the recreational season, that is a calendar year. So for 2013, we had no recreational landings at all. And this is a winter fishery for us. And I'm talking about the um, the ocean fishery, of course, we have, you know, our internal waters fisheries on the Albemarle Roanoke, and we certainly had landings there, but I was specifically referring to the ocean fishery. We did have some releases that came in on the ocean fishery on the recreational side. I, I, I want to say it was something like 1,500 fish that were released, but dismally low. Thanks. Have you seen any... Um any trends in the Albemarle fishery while we're on the topic? Certainly both commercial and recreational landings have been lower the past several years. And, you know, again, we're waiting for um, the stock assessment to be reviewed so we can um, determine, you know, what, if any, management action is required. Certainly 2011, um, the Juvenile Abundance Index in 2011 was one, was, I think it was like our second highest on record, which, you know, it was a great year for a lot of states up and down the coast in terms of the JAI. Thank you. I, I just wonder, um, having heard that, how much uh, of a factor climate change has been in, in uh, the apparent decline in those North Carolina landings. Are those fish not going as far south, in other words? <clears throat> but I guess that's yet to be determined. Thank you. All right, let's uh, to keep us moving along. I'm going to let uh, Mike move into his presentation, which is kind of a discussion of the next steps pending the peer review to let the board know, you know, what different pathways are available if action is needed following the results. Mike? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, just to catch everybody up on um, how we got to this point, as we anticipate the results of the peer review, Report um, back in March of 2011, the board instructed the plan development team to draft an addendum. Uh, that addendum contained management options that uh, aim to reduce striped bass fishing mortality up to 40 percent. 
and uh, it included measures that further protect the spawning stock when concentrated and vulnerable. Additionally, some of the background material that went into that document were recent performance of the fishery, status of the stock, the juvenile recruitment, basically all the things that Dr. Drew just took you through based on this most recent assessment, except at that time that was based on the 2009 stock assessment update results. There was also some information on mycobacteriosis and habitat areas of importance. And so that um, the PDT drafted that for the August 2011 meeting, and uh, the document explored reductions in F ranging from zero to 56% using projections of abundance, spawning stock biomass, and landings from 2011 through 2017 under low or average recruitment levels. And so that, as a reminder, that those projections were based on the results from the 2009 stock assessment update. Um, included in that document were proposed commercial management options um, to achieve those projection scenarios. And that, those were changes to minimum size limits, reduction to the commercial quota, season closures, and some additional spawning stock protection. The protection for the spawning stock um, was based on or, or focused on the jurisdictions of the Hudson River, the Delaware Bay, the Chesapeake Bay, and the Albemarle Sound, Ro Roanoke River. And also included in the document were similar proposed recreational management options, changes to size limit, bag limit, season closures, um, modifications to the Chesapeake Bay spring trophy fishery, and spawning stock protection for that fishery as well. And so the PDT drafted all of those management options into a document, brought it back to the board in August of 2011. And at that time, we were also going through a 2011 stock assessment update. And so uh, the board postponed action on that addendum until we got the updated results from that 2011 stock assessment update. Um, so they tasked the PDT to incorporate the new results into the projections, rerun everything, and bring it back to the board um, for the annual meeting in 2011. At that point, they also reviewed the stock assessment update results from 2011, uh, from the 2011 assessment, and decided to postpone further action on that draft addendum until the results from the the benchmark peer-reviewed assessment became available, and that's um, where we stand right now. So as a result, that addendum never actually ended up going out for public comment. So <clears throat> I, I just wanted to paint that picture so we could put ourselves into a position um, as we anticipate that peer review report for the board to um, react to those results. And so, um, as Dr. Drew mentioned, that's available in mid-September. And so, I, I've laid out two timelines here for discussion purposes in terms of uh, the board taking action. Uh, the first would be initiating a draft addendum at this meeting. Um, so, given that timeline, we would have the PDT would update everything based on the anticipated results of this um, peer review assessment. Uh, we could bring a draft back for public comment um, in October of 2013. That would be at our annual meeting. And then we would conduct public hearings through the winter and bring any document that was proposed today back to the board for final action at the February meeting in 2014. The second potential timeline um, would be to not take action today, but take action in a, uh, at our annual meeting in October. At that point, um, the PDT would be instructed to draft the document for the February meeting. Um, the board would approve it for public comment. At that point, we would conduct hearings in the spring of 2014 and then take final action at the May meeting. Um, so those are the, the two potential timelines moving forward. Um, I, I'll just, before I wrap up, I'll just mention that um, keep in mind what the implementation schedule would look like based on this hypothetical document that we're, that 
we've discussed timelines for. Um, for, exa for example, Dr. Duvall n noted that North Carolina has a winter fishery that begins in late 2013. So just something to keep in mind um, as the board discusses the next steps and, and is responsive to the benchmark peer review. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks, Mike. And I think it's important for the board to also, as you look at a February or a May um, action date by the board, states will need a time to implement any actions that would have been approved. Um, depending on regulatory and legislative processes. So uh, looking for some input from the board as we uh, prepare for these pending peer review. Got Paul and then Pat. Um, yeah, I guess uh, one change I would make, is, or, well, I would, I'd probably want to see modifications to the draft addendum that was prepared almost two years ago, if not two years ago. Um, and uh, to incorporate any new uh, reference point changes um, or suggestions that might uh, develop from the peer review, that would be one thing. I would consider um, modifying uh, that uh, mortality rate reduction from 40 to perhaps something more akin to um, what the uh, assessment suggests it might be 30. Um, based on what I've heard just today, I would probably exempt uh, North Carolina fisheries um, from any, uh, any um, uh, possible action. So that would be the Albemarle Roanoke fisheries, I suppose, um, from this. They don't uh, seem to be contributing um, in any way uh, to any, any possible declines. Um, so those are the those kinds of things, um, I'd like to at least have a discussion at some point. I don't know if it's for today uh, or the next meeting, but I can see where we might want to discuss um, modifying, putting a, putting a finer point uh, on the addendum. Personally, um, I think the addendum does need uh, to be, uh, to go through continued development, go through the public process, I felt that way two years ago. I feel even stronger today. I've heard nothing um, today or, or since uh, the start of developing uh, the addendum um, that uh, supports not, not taking an action. So, Thanks, Paul. I recognize we're on a tight timeline today. I think what I'd like to do is get the board input as to whether or not the board feels like we should be directing staff to initiate an addendum at this meeting if so, we're going to have to try to provide that guidance to the staff or if the board wants to wait until the results become available in October. So we can focus the discussion on that point and then see where we need to go. So I got um, people that want to speak, just raise your hand for a minute. I'll get you down. I got Pat next. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> um, I think the report and update that we had from Mike was uh, excellent and very timely. I agree with Paul, what Paul's comments were, but I, and I think I'd like to be a, a little stronger in my words, <clears throat> I'd like to have the uh, PDT take a hard look at those recommendations that you made two years ago. And you have the inside information as to what the review was from uh, South Arc 57. Um, and I agree with you, Mr. Chairman. I think if we take that updated information and have the uh, PDT or technical committee put together and staff put together the skeleton for what this new uh, amendment should look like, I think it would give us a leg up on where we're going to have to go. I think anybody who doesn't realize we're going to have to take some corrective action either has their head in the sand or they're not paying attention. And, and I don't want to embarrass anybody, but the fact of the matter is here's another case where we've paid so much attention to striped bass over the last 15 years. We haven't allowed it to crash. We aren't about let it, ready to let it crash. And I think if we get a leg up on the public's uh, input to us saying, hey, you guys are going to let this thing crash, in other words, let's get out in the forefront. I agree with you. Let's start an amendment today with the skeleton information that we have and update it and go from there. And I'd be willing to make that motion later in the meeting, Mr. Chairman. Thanks, Pat. Guy, uh, Jim. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, and I agree both with Paul and, and, and what Pat said. I, I think we're, we're definitely going towards some management. Um, but as a practical 
argument here is I think if we started an addendum now, we try to do a full one, and, and this really goes to, to Katie and Mike. It's, it's like I think you're going to have a lot more options because right now we don't know. We got 40 percent. And then maybe it's going to go down to 30 percent, but just kind of shooting in the dark, it's going to you're going to have like six, eight options, whatever, for each one of the different you know pieces of this, and the, and the document's just going to get a lot bigger. Um, I like Pat's idea if we could get something of a basic framework or a skeleton of this, so we've got a, a document to build on when we come back. But it, as much as I'd like to save time, um, I'm not sure how unwieldy a, a, an addendum is going to be if we develop it now and then come back in October. And we got a lot of stuff in there that we really you know, don't even need to consider. So you tell me, do you think you guys could frame this thing and at least somewhat simplistic and, and reduce it down to maybe your best guesses at what might happen so we can – I think that's the only way we're going to save any time. Thanks. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, I think there are some things we can do um, between now and when we meet at the annual meeting, um, specifically trying to update a lot of the background information, sort of set the stage for the addendum, pull in some of the information from the peer review report once we get that back. Um, some of the more, you know, management measures and what ex what exactly those mean in terms of moving forward and how um, those m proposed management measures would be implemented. I, it would be helpful to have more direction from the board before we took those projections and, s and tried to turn them into here's some proposed management measures. Um, to get us the fishing mortality reductions that you guys are interested in. Thanks, Mike. Um, Tom, did you have your hand up? I'm just going to go right around the horn. I'm keeping, your, keeping track. It seems this is a lot of deja vu. I've gone through this process, I guess, in the last 20 years where we've gone to striped bass and basically prepared an addendum about four or five times then basically because of what the stock assessment says, we didn't do it and put a lot of time and a lot of effort into going on. And I don't have my head buried in the sand. I mean, I'm looking at the facts. I mean, this stock is not crashing. The stock is not as robust. But understand, when we had this stock, when it opened up in 92, we had a moratorium for almost 10 years. Even when we opened it up, we opened it up with a limited commercial fishery and a limited recreational. It was mostly catch and release. And that's why those, a lot of those big fish got to be bigger and maybe reproducing. We are probably more of a stable. And, you know, it was like I remember that when we did bluefish, there was a real option to basically put in dr dramatic measures on bluefish and cut it all the way back down. And then we looked at the 50-year average on bluefish and found that we were above the 50-year average. So what I'm going to be looking at is the long-term average of where we are with striped bass under all the factors that are going on and not doing another knee-jerk reaction as we've done four times. New Jersey's changed its regulations because of knee-jerk reaction twice. And I don't want to do it again. Um, Rob O'Reilly. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I do support the addendum. I just don't support trying to do something right now. The reason I say that is um, I was part of the PDT in 2011. It was a very awkward situation. The PDT did not really know how to address the reductions in F because of various size limit regimes and other factors. Um, the PDT at that time looked more at hoping to come to the board with maybe some way of looking at maximum spawning potential. Um, so I know it was a very awkward situation, and I think that the technical committee, um, by and large at that time, didn't really support um, any kind of change, any kind of reduction either. So I would recommend that if there's going to be an addendum that ASMFC staff, along with the technical committee, uh, be able to tell the management board what would be practical to move forward with in an addendum. Um, I think an addendum can be something that can be positive. It doesn't have to be uh, sweeping, but certainly there's some conservation measures that uh, might be good to look at uh, given that things have changed over time, we're focusing a lot on recruitment. I know in Virginia for 2013, at least through the preliminary stages, uh, we're looking at average to above average recruitment for the year. 
that's good compared to 2012, which was the lowest of all time in Virginia. And then you go to 2011, it was the highest. So recruitment is a pretty good arbiter of, of how things might be. And we know there's been bad recruitment. And I think overlying this, the, the poor to um, average recruitment in Chesapeake Bay over the you know, six years or so does play a role in maybe the need for some conservation measures in an addendum. Thank you. Thanks, Rob. Got John. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I would also like to wait to initiate the draft addendum until the stock assessment has been uh, reviewed and released so we can have a better chance to study that. Uh, to sort of follow up on what Tom was saying, I feel the same thing that we're seeing in Delaware. The stock has definitely come down but does not seem to be in any imminent danger of crashing. And having the stock at a smaller but still large size has seemed to have had some positive impacts on some of our other fisheries, in particular, uh, weak fish are coming back some in Delaware Bay where they had been pretty much uh, extirpated from the bay for several years. Now, I'm not going to blame that all on striped bass, but all I'm saying is that now the striped bass stock has come down to a more manageable level. We are seeing weak fish again. Thank you. Thanks, John. I got Terry, Richie, and Russell. Terry? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm, I'm actually happy to report to the board that Maine anglers are seeing the best striper fishing than they've had in the last four or five years. All, all year classes, um, uh, slot fish, a lot of small ones. But that being said, I'm going to follow John and support an initiation of a draft addendum at the October meeting following the receipt of the, of the, of the uh, peer-reviewed uh, uh, benchmark report. I, th I do agree with Paul and and Pat and Jim that um, the PDT should be tasked to, to, to uh, take a look at the uh, 2011 addendum, update it, and be prepared to bring back to us a template to, that we can move forward with with some uh, expeditious manner. Thanks, Terry. Richie? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I think uh, the PDT could look at, beyond Paul's suggestion, a 30 percent, uh, what it would take to get to the target. Uh, both spawning stock biomass and mortality rates because uh, I'm kind of sensing that uh, this, you know, we're going to fall between the threshold and the target because if we are below the threshold, we got to take action. So uh, it, it seems logical that that's where this is going to come out and that's what I'd like to see is how do we get back to the target. Thanks, Richie. Russell? Um, I'd like to get my head out of sand. Uh, it's not down there where Pat had said. In Maryland, <clears throat> we got so cotton picking many striped bass that we're being smothered out in a commercial fishery. We got two year olds that are like minnows in the marinas and around the boats. Um, we got so many two year olds that our pound netters can't pound net for them, trying to catch, they're trying to catch uh, croakers and, and spot. Uh, in Manhattan, they can't do it because we got so many two-year-olds that they fill the pound nets. They got to call all these. All this has to go on a culling board. Uh, they're a nuisance for us. I like to ship some up north and down to North Carolina. So we listen. They're eating us out of the bay. They, I think, they're responsible for part of our decline in the crab industry. I also think they're responsible for eating a lot of the other fish up in the bay, but they opened up, the state opened up the hook and line fishery. In two days, the quota was caught. So that means we got three and four year olds in there too, or maybe five year olds. But we got so many two year olds that it's impossible to count them. And we're talking, if you go home and tell our commercial and our charter fishermen, that, that you're going to reduce it, I, I think they'd revolt because they can't even fish commercially for straight bass in Chesapeake Bay. So it doesn't even sound reasonable from Maryland that you would cut the production or catch uh, the catch by 30 percent because we like to bring you down there and take some of the fish out of the bay because two-year-olds are putting us under. Thank you. Thanks, Russell. That was everybody on the list um, asked to speak at this time. So just back to the uh, 
the agenda topic is whether or not the board wants to take any action today. We don't have to. Uh, we can be very specific and direct staff to begin drafting the addendum. Um, we could have staff just begin developing a skeleton that we can fill in come October, and that should help expedite the process a little bit. Uh, Pat? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think listening to the comments around the table, uh, there were some excellent comments and a combination thereof. It just seems to me that uh, with the direction that the board has suggested so far, it looks as though uh, update of the existing PDT, a good uh, interaction with the technical committee, uh, determine uh, the direction we should be going because you're going to have to give the information back to the board to give us a chance to make some suggestions. Along with what Mr. Gilmore said, too many options are going to kill us. So keep the options sweet and short and tight. It's no rush uh, because, as, as I had said and Tom responded, I don't believe he has his head in the sand or other people around the table who really have an interest in striped bass have their head in the sand. I just want to make sure if we have some time between now and October to put this together so we're ahead of the curve. We have control of it. We don't let emotions rise up in the public out there, and they drive the process. This is a case where you, Mr. Chairman, um, uh, can direct this activity to make sure we get it on track in a reasonable time. And I do think if we have enough information background that we bring forward, the assessment that comes back from the peer review, um, I think our technical committee has a pretty good idea the direction we have to go, but we don't know that yet. And I think based on their best ability to sort out where we should go, let them bring us a, we'll call it a white paper or call us a skeleton uh, addendum for our next meeting. Now, if you need it in the form of a formal motion, I'll make that. But I'm not sure we need that because I think all it will take at that point in time is just to say, I move that we create addendum whatever and be done with it. But in the form of a white paper or in the form of an update of the PDT report, to the board, I think that'll help us. Unless some new ideas come forward uh, as a result of the peer review, I think we, we, we've got a handle on the direction we need to be going. Well, you know, just based upon the feedback that's been um, discussed today, it seems like the majority of people that spoke um, thought that we should wait until we get more results, but it would be beneficial for staff to begin working with the TC to update the PID, uh, public information document, so we have something to work with in October if we need to act. So I would ask that if, um, unless somebody believes we should be taking a different route at this time, um, we'll proceed in that manner. Okay, we'll go ahead, we'll go ahead and um, we'll work with Mike and the TC and the advisory panel as needed to, uh, to um, put that information together for the October meeting. Um, our last item under, uh, um, under other business, um, Fish and Wildlife Service wanted to provide an update on the uh, tag and cruise. So, I don't know, Bill, did you want to do that or Wilson? Go ahead, Wilson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, just a quick update. Recall that in 2013 we had a coastal recreational fishing license grant from North Carolina to myself and Dr. Roger Rulison in the amount of $238,000 that allowed us to conduct both the traditional winter, I mean, yeah, 2013. We had the, the full amount from the Coastal Recreational Fishing License Program that allowed us to conduct the traditional winter trawling for striped bass as well as to conduct uh, charter hook and line trips out of Rudy Inlet, Virginia for tagging stripers, and we were able to do that. They, we had applied originally for a three-year grant that would cover 2014 and 2015 as well. The Cruffle program challenged us to find a 50% match for the 2014 and 2015, and they gave us an extended period of time to locate a match, and we were unable to meet that challenge. So as it stands right now, we do have a sufficient match. We're going to use part of our Atlantic Coastal Fisheries Cooperative Management Act allocation from the commission to match the charter boat component of the tagging program, which is $8,000 for $16,000 total. We don't have the funding that we need to conduct the traditional winter trawl uh, program on a, a research vessel. We do have two research vessels that have indicated that they are available and willing to do the work, but we would have to find the funding. And uh, if we went with the low bid, that total amount that we would need for that component of it is somewhere in the neighborhood of about $220,000. 
I think. And we were hoping to be able to tag using the trawl caught fish as well as the hook and line caught fish for three years in a row so that we would be able to have a rigorous study design and then compare survivability between the two different types of tagging operations. So uh, that's my report, Mr. Chairman. I, I will add that uh, Dr. Rulison and I still have the potential, I suppose, for finding that total amount of funding through some other source, and we are still uh, looking for potential sources of funding. So that's my report. Thank you. Thank you, Wilson. The board have any questions for Wilson? Michelle. Now, Michelle. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Wilson, um, how far out did you all have to go this year to find stripers to tag? I presume you want me to address that distribution question. <laughs> and the answer is that uh, this year we had to go further offshore than we've ever had to go before. We were uh, mostly operating in the vicinity of the Chesapeake Bay Light Tower, for those of you who know where that is, in the neighborhood of 12 to 20 miles offshore, the mouth of Chesapeake Bay. We did not catch a single striped bass in North Carolina waters this year um, using the, the trawler and all of our hook and line operations were off the mouth of Chesapeake Bay because we could not find any reports of any striped bass in North Carolina waters. And, and that uh, continues a trend that we have, have observed since about 2007, I think, that the fish seem to be further north and further offshore during the, during the winter months. Remember, we're, we're operating in a very uh, narrow spatio-temporal window out there, so, so we're only out there usually for a couple of weeks. Thanks, Wilson. Uh, Lewis? No, I'm going to ask you all for money. Just, I've given the money. Um, I, I did want to let you know that, I mean, we are committed to this. This is an important coastwide tagging study. All the states around the table benefit from this study. Um, I hate losing this time series. Um, we tried to do about more, but we did the first year and half the second year committed to half the third year. Um, 200 grand is not a lot of money when it's divvied up amongst 15, 16 states. Um, I, would, I would suggest, you know, we will step back and do everything we can to make that money available as the 50% match. Um, so don't think that, that time has run out and we can't still make something happen. So I hope we can, but um, I, I've sort of, put my foot down on the 50% match, so I'm not coming up with any more money, but I think we've been pretty generous in, in what we have put together. So think about that, soul search a little bit, because, I mean, Roger and Wilson could give you a very detailed account of how important that, that cruise is, not just for stripers, but for sturgeon, for many other species that we all rely on at ASMFC for age and growth and that type of information. So just keep it in mind. Thanks, Lewis. Any other comments before we uh, wrap the meeting up? All right, that's um, all the agenda items. Uh, meeting adjourned. We'll start the business session in about 10 minutes, Paul. Does that sound good? Paul said sounds good.